Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 26th, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, sour mashing a Berliner Weiss. Montreal home brewer Sean Coates tells us how to unleash nastiness in the mash tun to brew a tart, tasty summer beer. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first. Go to our website and click on the Amazon logo on our website. Then you'll be taken to Amazon, and you can shop just like normal. The only difference is we'll be getting a piece of the pie, a piece of your uh, spending there. It won't cost you any extra and uh, you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. You can find our basic brewing iPhone and Android podcast apps on their respective stores. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. I'm almost ready to uh, launch into the world of no-chill brewing I got my uh, heavy-duty plastic container in the mail a couple of days ago. It's the one that uh, Bob Stimsky recommended for me. I also got some uh, high-temperature hose to go from my kettle to the container. So uh, all I need is time and uh, the inclination to uh, to jump into it. Uh, I'm planning to post an episode of Basic Brewing Video before the end of the week. We, uh, we took a little tour of the Seattle area with our tour guide, Zot O'Connor. It was a lot of fun. Uh, So be sure to look out for that. Now, uh, we've talked about Berliner Weiss before in this program. In fact, we dedicated an episode to it a while back with uh, Andy Sparks and Mike Tonsmeyer. Uh, It's a low-gravity, refreshing, sour beer that's perfect for summer. Uh, Kind of a theme that I'm going with this summer, uh, lighter beers. Uh, in In that show... Andy and Mike uh, talked about how they they brewed theirs, and they soured their beers with the lactobacillus uh, in the fermenter. But uh, there is another way to do it. A while back, Sean Coates sent me a link to a blog post on his blog uh, about his brewing an award-winning Berliner Weiss using a sour mash to get the tartness. And I've been wanting to do a sour mash ever since I talked to uh, Chris Colby about that process a while back on this show. And uh, I've also wanted to do a Berliner Weiss myself for a long time. So uh, I thought it would be a great idea to pick Sean's brain on the process. Well, Sean Coates, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. This is the summer of the session beers, with me at least. Uh, I have brewed, now I'm working on my third low-gravity beer, uh, I was inspired by a small beer that I that we had up in uh, uh, up in Seattle at the conference that was only 1.8 percent alcohol, uh, and I, I got the recipe for that, so I'm making that. And so, and I've been trying some other things to kind of um, more of a, a method for self preservation than anything else because the. <laughs> ever since I got this kegging system, my calorie count has gone up for some reason. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. It doesn't, it doesn't happen to me ever. <laughs> so, so one of the uh, one of the uh, beers that is is famous for being refreshing and satisfying and low in alcohol, and one that we've talked about on this show, is a Berliner Weiss. And we, I went back and and reviewed a show we did with the Michael Tonsmeyer and Andy Sparks, uh, talking about Berliner Weisses, and they did. Uh, souring after or in the fermenter uh, with uh, lacto in the fermenter. But you, with your Berliner Weiss, uh, have taken a different approach. Yeah. Um, so with mine, the souring's done before we even hit the boil. All, all the sour is in there. Um, and uh, that, that gives me a few things. But 
it, it kind of gives you a, kind of an idea what it's going to taste like, but it also helps keep everything on the, on the um, pre-boil side to keep your equipment from getting contaminated. So you're doing, you're using a sour mash. Yeah, that's right. And I, I went back in a research. We also did an episode. <laughs> we've done an episode on just about everything on this uh, <laughs> on this program, uh, thankfully. Uh, but uh, I did an interview with Chris Colby on the sour mashing process years ago. So I went back and listened to that because, you know, I'm getting older and I forget things. Uh, and I also did an interview with the guys over in Oklahoma, uh, m- members of the the. Uh, fellowship of Oklahoma Ale Makers on a Berliner Weiss that they did that where they used a sour mash. Uh, so I've got some different notes here to kind of uh, compare and contrast uh, between your process and, and the others. But go ahead and, and start us from the beginning. If if you're if we're not familiar with Berliner Weisses uh, and we're not familiar with the sour mashing process, just take us from scratch, Sean. Sure. So Berliner Weiss is um, a very, very small beer, like we were talking about, very low alcohol, kind of easily drinking um, session beer, um, traditionally brewed in Berlin in Germany. Um, And it is uh, a sour beer so that it's very acidic. Um, It's almost like lemonade in how acidic it is. It's really refreshing, really light, easy to drink. Um, Wow as much as you like, really. I mean, I, I'm, I think you'd have to drink a whole lot to get drunk on it. And I, and I don't think, uh, I kind of think the water in it would kind of offset that too. You'd have to, you'd have to try really hard. <laughs> um, so it weighs in around 3% alcohol, usually. Um, it depends on the Berliner Weiss, of course. Mine, mine's right around there, right around 3%. Um, and it's just sour and refreshing and just really nice to drink. Um, has kind of a wheat, a little bit of wheat character to it, usually. Um, and it's just kind of yogurty and, and smooth and creamy. Um, but you have to like the acidity. You kind of really have to like lemonade in order to like a Berliner Weiss, usually. And typically, or traditionally, in uh, in Berlin where, or in Germany where it's served, uh, there's either a Woodruff syrup or a raspberry syrup uh, that they that they serve uh, with the beer. In fact, uh, according to Michael Tonsmeyer, uh, his girlfriend went over to uh, to Germany and asked for a plain Berliner Weiss, and they wouldn't serve it to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just listened to that same episode. It was a pretty funny story. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's it is a traditionally beer that's that's meant to be flavored, but it is it's such a tasty beer by itself. It's so refreshing and tart and uh you know, I don't know and, and I've had it with the different syrups in it and I just like it plain better. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I much prefer it plain. I've had it with um the raspberry syrup and with the woodruff. The woodruff is really interesting because it's a flavor you don't usually have. It's kind of um herbal and vanilla-y and kind of almost like a tiny bit like mouthwash or I guess like Jagermeister, that kind of fernet, that kind of strange like herbal flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- those are, they're also very sweet, those syrups. So they, they kind of offset the, the tartness of the beer and, and make it sweet up front and then kind of sour in the finish. Um, but I also prefer it plain. It's, it's much, in my opinion, it's much better plain. So a sour mash. What, what yeah. are we talking about? So a sour mash is, um, I mean, there are a few ways to do it. Um, for me, I just uh, kind of go about a regular mash, um, just kind of keep it a little bit thick um, just so that I can dilute it a little bit later, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec, I think. Um, but just do, just do I just do a regular mash, and then when the mash is converted or when it's complete, I usually leave mine for about an hour um, and then do a starch test. Uh, and then I, I kind of cool it down a little bit to about, um, right around 40 C. Um, so I guess the opposite of usual, you can do the other conversion for me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Wait, uh, <laughs> the shoes on the other foot, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, the 40 C would be around 115 degrees Fahrenheit. There we go. See, that's how, that's how we feel most of the time. Too. I know. <laughs> I know. I completely sympathize. I'm just an idiot. <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, there's, it's not, a, it's not about being an idiot. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I cool it down to about 40, uh, and some of that is just time. I leave my mash tun open, um, just let the air get at it. But I also have, um, I've done it a few times. I've added some cold water in the past. I've also added some ice in the past to kind of speed that up a little bit and just stir in some ice, um, just to get it right down to about 40 C. And that's the, that's around a temperature where, um, where lacto can grow or lactobacillus can grow. And that, that's the bacteria that will make lactic acid and that's what makes it sour and acidic. Um, and so in, in the other episodes where, where you're talking about where they sour after uh, the boil in the, in the fermenter, 
they they used uh, lactic culture. I think it was from White Labs, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can you can get them from White Labs and from White Yeast, I think. Um, and I, I just didn't use that at all, actually. Um, so with with our grain, with our brewing grain, we uh, when we buy our grain, it's covered in lactobacillus um, already. So it's all over the husk of the grain, and that comes from, mostly from the malting process, from what I understand. Um, just because they they use a wet process to do that, and when the grain dries out, usually uh, base malt is not killed high enough in order is not killed high enough to kill that lactobacillus, so it kind of just lives on the grain the whole time. Um, so what I do with mine is I I take around a pound of base grain um, and throw it into my mash uh, once it's cooled down to about 40 C. I don't I don't mill it. Um, I milled it on my first batch, and, and the batch got really really starchy. Um, it kind of liberated all those starches inside, and it wasn't at a high enough temperature to convert. So mm. um, all those starches just kind of went into the beer, and it it was it was still good. It was tasty, but it uh, let's say it led to some digestion issues. <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't the most pleasant beer to have around. Um, <laughs> or maybe you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> or, or me afterwards, or anyone really <laughs> had some. Uh, so the last, last few times I've done it, I haven't milled that grain, and it's helped a lot with that starch uh, kind of kicking around. There, I think some of the starch still comes out of the grain, but not nearly as much. Kind of like um, if you've ever under-milled your grain or forgot to mill grain doing a mash, um, which I've done both of those, unfortunately. Um, it just <laughs> You don't get much sugar out of it, and it's kind of the same thing. You don't get much starch out of it, I don't think. Now, now to, to refute uh, your claim that I'm not an idiot, uh, <laughs> uh, I looked at the thermometer chart here. And 40 degrees Celsius is actually 105 degrees Fahrenheit and not 115. Okay. So, <laughs> so people can stop emailing. They could stop <laughs> composing that email right now because I just... <laughs> <laughs> There'll be other opportunities, I'm sure, to correct me later on, <laughs> or both of us, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're doing is we're, we're we're what your technique is. You do you do the mash, uh, you convert those starches into sugars, you cool it down, and then you add uh, unmalt or unmashed uh, fresh grain to get that lacto uh, bacteria in there. Uh, and you're hoping that you hit a temperature that it's happy at, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and I, th- I think that temperature range is pretty wide. Um, just I think I've, I mean, I've heard of people mashing at uh, sort of doing a sour mash at a much higher temperature and a little bit of a lower temperature. Um, and it's just pretty easy for me to keep it right, right between 35 and 40 C. Um, just got kind of like under a heating vent in my house or out in the summertime, I guess. And how do you how do you how long are we talking about a, a, a period here where we want to do this sour mash and how do you maintain the temperature over that time? Right. So I, I do the sour mash in my mash tun, which is just a it's just a regular kind of cooler. Um, it's like a sixty eight liter cooler um, that a lot of home brewers use, I guess. Um, so it's it's pretty well insulated on its own. Like I can, I don't lose much temperature over a regular hour of mashing, maybe a degree C or two. Um, so even at a higher temperature, there's there's a higher differential, but I, I didn't really lose that much heat. But what I what I did was um, every few hours I would open the cooler to taste it um, because you can, I guess if you do it enough times you could probably figure out how long your your particular setup takes or with your particular recipe it takes to to do the sour mash. But I think it's really important to taste it. Um, so I did that just about every eight hours or eight to twelve hours after uh, adding that grain just to see how it was progressing. And when I did, I'd check the temperature and make sure it was above 35C. Uh, and if it wasn't, then I'd add, um, i just kind of put the kettle on and, and boil a couple liters of water and just throw those in and stir it around and check the temperature again to make sure I get it up, which is why I went with a really thick mash to start with. Mm. Um, but it's a, it's a really small beer anyway. Like we were saying, it's three, about 3% alcohol in the finish, so the starting gravity is below 1040. Um, so it's it's really easy to make a thick mash and then not worry too much about diluting it. Uh, when you're adding the hot water infusions, which is basically you're doing kind of like the same thing you would for an infusion mash. And when you say taste, you're you're tasting this. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a simple enough process, but uh, I'm doing a sour, and I'll talk about my process here in just a minute. But mm-hmm. I'm in the process of doing a sour mash now, and and I put it on at noon yesterday, and this morning uh, after breakfast I went out. And uh, it was about eight o'clock in the morning, and uh, I, I opened up the the kettle, or uh, where this mash is, and and my lizard brain did not want to taste that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't blame you. <laughs> now, uh, 
you know, I've I've been some places and I've smelled some things. I mean, including, you know, I worked for a couple of summers in a funeral home when I was in college. So <laughs> I've smelled a wide variety of things in my life. And I, I, I'm hard pressed to describe the smell that was coming out of that kettle. Uh, it was kind of a a, um, a warm, organic, kind of dark, not rotten exactly, but just kind of an off uh, smell. But that changed. I mean, by this afternoon, it was smelling a lot more tart. Yep. Yeah. So um, if you've ever left your mash, this is, if you've ever done a really long brewing day and got to the end of the day and realized that you hadn't cleaned out your mash tun during the boil and left that for a couple of days and forgot about it, kind of the same thing starts to happen. It's that really nasty kind of like garbagey, green, terrible smell. Um, that, that happened to mine as well. Um, I've smelled that in other places too. Like if I, when, one summer I left, uh, just a garbage, garbage can full of grain out of my driveway cause, uh, I missed the composting pickup, uh, and I didn't have my own compost pile going and it, I was working outside a couple of days later and I could smell it. The same thing was happening in that, in that bucket, um, or walk past a brewery where they just throw the grain out in a kind of a bin on the side of the road and, and wait for the farmer to come along and pick it up. And it was that same horrible compost smell almost that, that is beckoning you to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> Canadians have a different palate. <laughs> well, somebody on I posted on Facebook, and and somebody said uh, I think they said it was something somewhere between dumpster and vomit. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds pretty accurate to me. Yeah, maybe some cheese in there, a little bit of yogurt, maybe <laughs> some sort of dairy. <laughs> so so so. It's it's being smelling t- more tart. I, I take it as a good sign that I'm that I'm headed in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. It starts to smell um, kind of a little bit more like a sour beer, but not with all the kind of barnyard and funk that comes along with like a like a goose or like a Flanders Red. Just kind of like a sweet, almost like sweet kind of acidic smell, which is which is strange because it doesn't taste very sweet. Now the. Do we have anything to worry about at this point? I mean, we're actually spoiling this this mash. Throughout. We're actually spoiling this this grain water mixture on purpose. Is there anything that we need to be careful of? Well, I don't think there's anything you need to really worry about. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that I do, and I'm I'm glad you brought it up, is uh, before I, I kind of seal up my mash tun after um, after cooling it down and throwing in that grain, I flood it with CO2 just from my kegging tank. Um, I just put the put one of the, a hose in the cooler and just kind of let it run for a little bit uh, until I feel like there's enough CO2 in there to kind of blanket the mash or fill up the rest of the cooler. Um, and from what I understand, that prevents kind of the bad things from growing and, and allows the lacto to grow um, and, and start converting some of those sugars into lactic acid um, because the lacto will the lactobacillus will work uh, in an anaerobic environment mm-hmm. and the bad guys, whatever they are, um, won't. So I guess uh, if there's like wild yeast in there that might start converting those sugars even before the boil, um, it needs some oxygen to grow to actually be effective. So if you can get most of that oxygen out, then that helps you with the uh, with making promoting the, the growth of the lactobacillus. And I was listening back to the episode that I did with Chris Colby on sour mashes, and I think his technique to keep the uh, oxygen out was to take some uh, plastic wrap uh, and put it directly on top of the mash uh, to, to keep the oxygen out or to try to keep the oxygen out. So if you don't have a kegging system, if you don't have access to, to CO2, that may be something that you want to try as well. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that too. I talked with a couple of brewers, at, like professional brewers, about about doing sour mashes before I did my first one. Um, and uh, John from The Alchemist in, in Waterbury, Vermont, um, said you know do whatever you can to make sure there's no oxygen at all touching your mash so put this, put plastic wrap on and push it down to make sure you get all the bubbles out and then flood it with co2 um and i, I just I, I went with the co2 the first time and it, and it worked seemed to work pretty well um and i was a little bit more zealous with the co2 these last couple times i've done it and it's it's as far as i can tell i'm not growing anything i shouldn't be growing it's still disgusting and <laughs> muddy and looks horrible and has kind of like a almost like an oil slick on top and it's just it's just horrible looking thing to taste. Um, but I don't think it's growing anything, any of the bad stuff, I hope. Well, well I guess the really bad stuff. You're still here. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I've survived. <laughs> but somewhere there ought to be a legal disclaimer saying, uh, please do research fully on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're immunocompromised, you might not want to make a sour mash beer and taste well, it. Well, seriously, I mean, yeah, that that, that may be a thing. Uh, but but looking at my 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 sour mash at this point, 
uh, is it's it looks like something's going on there. I mean, it bubbles it bubbles are coming up, and uh, you know, it's a little foamy on top. There, there looks like something's. Is that normal? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it it bubbles and it it makes a smell, um, and it it uh, off gases something. I don't I don't I don't even know what it is, but it goes through the CO two, and when you open it, you can smell it through the the rest of the house, um, and it. Uh, it definitely is active. It's not. It's not as active as a fermentation, but there's certainly something going on. So, how long? How long do you traditionally keep yours going before you find that it's tart enough for you? So, like I said, you need to, you need to really taste that thing every eight to twelve hours to make sure that you're not going to overshoot. Because um, um, one of the one of the things that some brewers do is they split uh, their sour mash, so they'll they'll pasteurize or chill part of their mash and sour the rest of it and kind of blend those two together to get the flavor they're looking for. Um, but I, I just I do my whole thing, and so you kind of need to make sure that that just doesn't get away from you and get really really sour. Um, but as kind of like a um, kind of like a guess to where where someone who's never done this before might need to target, uh, mine take around forty eight hours from the time I chill them and pitch in the the grain to when I need to boil them. I think I think that's what I'm I'm targeting, uh, mainly because we hope that there's some rain that's going to come through. Uh, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> my, yeah, it's been hot there. <laughs> so, so my mine's working outside. So I'm hoping that uh, that I can get it done before the rain comes. You know, salt over the shoulder, knock wood, and all that <laughs> stuff. But um, uh, so so we once the once the mash is sour enough, you think? Oh, um, I, the question I want to ask is, can you get it too sour for your yeast? Well, I think you can. Um, I haven't actually gone that far, um, but I'm pretty sure that you can convert a lot of that sugar into lacto into lactic acid, and I think it would probably become too acidic for your yeast, um, which is another reason you need to really taste that to make sure it's not getting away from you, um, which is kind of a hard thing to do if you've never really tasted a Berliner Weiss or tasted a sour mash beer before. But if it's getting too sour to taste, I think your your yeast is probably mm. probably not going to be happy with it. Um, I don't know for sure. I've never killed off yeast by pitching it into into uh, a word that was too sour or a beer that was too sour, but um, I, I have had sour beers that I've made where um, the the bugs just stopped working. Mm. Um, like I have a Flanders Red that just didn't get lactic enough, and I think uh, I think that it might have uh, got a little bit too acidic and just didn't get a lactic character from from being too acidic. And we're we're looking for something around the level of lemonade somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, Make yeah. It- that's just about right. I mean, like if you've ever had a really, a really good fresh lemonade um, that has kind of the right amount of sugar in it, doesn't isn't overly sweet and didn't come from a can or from concentrate. If you have like a really good lemonade, that's that's pretty close to the same level of acidity that I get from mine. Okay, so we've got the right amount of, of acidity, and we're ready to deal with our sour mash and take it to the next step. What happens then? Well, from then on, it's it's pretty much from for me, it's pretty much just like a regular brew. Um, I recirculate and kind of clear out some of those, some of the particles that are floating around in the mash just from being stirred, um, tasted every, every so often. Um, and then just kind of recirculate with my pump and then pump it into the kettle, um, and boil, but I boil for a very short time. So traditionally Berliner Weisses are either from, from what I understand anyway, are either not boiled or boiled for a very short amount of time. Um, and I went with a short boil with mine just to kind of uh, to to do that thing we were talking about earlier, where you um, sanitize your your uh, your work by um, by heating it, so all my equipment stays clean. Um, the mash tun just kind of gets cleaned out normally. I just use Moxie Clean or other cleaner. Um, but once it's boiled, then uh, all that lactobacillus dies and the lactic acid stays. So I, I, I go for about a 15 minute boil with mine. Um, and throw the hops in right at the start as soon as it boils, and I have my immersion chiller in there right from the start because it needs needs some time to sanitize. Yeah, I was I was listening to the episode with Mike Tonsmeyer, and he said that uh, on the one that we were tasting, uh, he did a decoction, uh, and he actually put his hops in the decoction, so he actually didn't boil that beer for any period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just brought it up to a simmer and then chilled it down and and pitched his uh, yeast in the in the lacto but again his he was putting the lactobacillus after uh after the fermentation so or or after the after the the boiling process so it's it's a bit different uh you would think that you would want to um 
or there would be advantages to killing the lactobacillus if you were doing a sour mash or whatever else is living in there. Uh, right. <laughs> you, yeah. You don't know what's in there. <laughs> So from what I can tell, the lacto won't actually grow at regular mashing temperatures. So, I mean, I've done an overnight mash before where it just kind of, like, kind of, um, it falls probably six or seven degrees C overnight um, just because I ran out of time one day and ended up being a fine triple. It didn't have any sour character to it. But I think in a regular mash tun, if you if you open that up or if you chill it down, there's enough stuff floating around in the air that you're going to get something in it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's kind of like doing an open fermentation, but not having a clean room to do it in, I guess, um, where you might, have, I guess it's probably even worse than an open fermentation because you don't have that, that pressure of gases coming out, out of the, out of the beer while it's fermenting. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's pretty important to, to sanitize that thing before you throw the yeast in. Cause so it doesn't have to compete with whatever happens to me in your mash after the mash is done. So you're just boiling your hops for 15 minutes. Yep. Yeah, I used um, Haller Tower in mine. You, you, for a Berliner Weiss, there's no hop character and there's no real bitterness. It's it's you you throw hops in just to call it a beer, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I threw uh, probably five grams of hops into mine, not very much at all, um, which I I think according to the calculator came up to something like five IBU, four or five IBU, which honestly I don't think anyone can really even taste. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the boil is a little strange because you throw the hops in and they kind of stick on the surface of the beer. Um, and the, the, the head on the beer, the, the foam that comes up when it first starts to boil, um, if you've ever had, ever had a beer that tends to um, kind of uh, boil over and grow out of the kettle, this, this is the kind of beer you really need to keep an eye on because there's a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know if it's protein from that extra, extra grain you've thrown in or if there's other things going on, but... It's a foamy beer. It's really, really foamy, at least for me. Um, hmm. It sticks to the kettle, and it, it, it the foam kind of really grows very, very thick. Um, and if you pull it off, I've pulled it off with a spoon. Um, I have a couple pictures on my blog. I guess those will be linked somewhere. But um, it's it's almost like meringue. It's like a soft whipped cream almost. It's it's really thick. The foam doesn't drop when you pull it off with a spoon. It just it's it's unlike any other foam that uh, I have in any of my other beers, including something like an oatmeal stout. It like the oatmeal stout pales in comparison to this when it comes to head retention um, in the kettle, at least. Hmm. Now, yeah. do you, do you stir that back in, or do you do you take it off? No, there's way too much to stir back in. I mean, I I, I did pretty small batches. My system will do um, around 60 liters maximum, so I guess that's about uh, about 15 gallons. And I do this, this is like a five to seven gallon batch usually. I do with a Berliner Weiss, um, and it'll grow right out of the kettle. So it's like a it's like 50 percent foam. Wow. Yeah, you have to really keep an eye on it um, before I dial it back. I usually dial it back a little bit um, just to keep that foam from growing out. Um, and once it, it, you kind of get that hot break, same kind of thing you normally get in regular beer where the foam breaks away and, and it, it starts to boil normally. But it could it could be like 100% or sorry, like 50% beer and 50% foam at, at one point. So there's no real scraping it off, at least, at least what I've done. <laughs> I wonder if Firm Cap S would help any of that. It might. I don't know. It's... I have no idea. It it uh, it's really different foam from normal, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if it didn't help. But if it does, cool. That's really helpful if you're doing a big batch, and especially if your kettle barely holds the beer that you're putting in. Yeah, <laughs> or the wort that you're putting in. Sounds like some planning ahead is in order. Uh, yeah, so- have a spray bottle <laughs> close by. <laughs> <laughs> and you, uh, what kind of yeast uh, did you use? So um, the nice thing about Berliner Weiss is that the yeast character is really clean. Um, it uh, it the real focus in that beer is the acidity and, and the, the lactic character, the the yogurty kind of character. Um, so I've always used like a clean American ale yeast. Um, so I use why use ten fifty six. Um, the the White Labs one would work fine. Or I've heard of people using the Kolsch yeast, um, and that's supposed to work really well too. But I, as far as I'm concerned, cleaner is better. Um, you just re- really want to kind of focus on that acidity. And you you've had some success with your. Berliner Weiss. I have, yeah. Um, so what what kind of promoted pushed me to, to write about it this year, um, finally, because I've had people ask me about it, and I just kind of point them at the recipe. I had some pictures in Flickr for a while where I wrote up a little bit about what I'd done, but I finally got around to writing a piece about it this year. Um, it was that uh, in, in our local competition this year, I got around to entering it, and it uh, it got a gold in the category, the sour category, and I have a raspberry version where I added a, a kilo of raspberries to half the batch, and that got a silver in the same category. They were kind of competing against each other, just the way that <laughs> the flights were collapsed. Um, so I ended up with two medals in that category. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> thanks, thanks. It was really nice. <laughs> well, that uh, uh, 
and you used uh, and we uh, you uh, I will link to your uh, the entries in your blog for the the detailed description of of how you did it, and you link to the recipe from that entry. Yep. Uh, and seancoates dot com s e a n c o a t e s dot com, in case the links get lost or whatever. Yep, you'll um, be able to find everything there. But uh, you used uh, Pilsner malt and wheat malt. Um, but, it, I mean, it's, it seems like a really simple recipe. Yeah, it's it's super simple. It's um, I, I ended up using a little bit of sugar in mine just because I really wanted to make sure it dried out a lot, um, just regular table sugar. But um, even this last time, I didn't update the recipe on my site, but I just used regular Canadian two-row, um, which... It's pretty close to Pilsner malt. Um, it's kiln really low. The the lava malt is really low on that. Um, it doesn't have that same kind of German or Bohemian um, pils character that you really need in something like a Helles. But I don't think it matters in this beer at all. Um, it's just kind of it's really cheap here. So um, I just used that and it turned out great. It's it's about sixty percent sixty percent barley and about forty percent wheat. Mm. Uh, it's 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 pretty easy. I don't I don't think you can mess up the recipe as long as you don't try and add a whole bunch of caramel malt or anything like that to it, or smoke malt. <laughs> <laughs> There's a brewer here. I, w- I won't tell you who he is, but you could probably figure it out. That makes a smoked Berliner Weiss, and in my opinion, it's terrible. <laughs> the, the flavors are just really conflicting. He makes a regular Berliner Weiss that's great, but the smoked one is just. I don't know. Some people seem to like it. He's made it more than once, so <laughs> so I guess some people like it enough that they'll, they'll buy it. But not for me. It's not for me. Well, I, I, ho- and I hope mine doesn't uh, turn out with that character. You'll, uh, <laughs> when I disclose how I'm, I'm maintaining my temperature, you'll you'll know why. But uh, uh, I went back and listened to an interview. Uh, it was back in the on the show where we did um, uh, the Stein beer uh, brewing, the brewing with the hot rocks over in Oklahoma with uh, Gene, and I'm not going to remember the the other guys' names. Uh, but uh, the foam members over there, they I tried their Berliner Weiss, and they did a sour mash. They used acidulated malt, and their sour mash was for three to four days uh, at 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 48 C, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that worked well for them. And that's 120 is what Chris Colby was recommending in the sour mash episode. So as you said before, I guess the lacto has a, a fairly wide range of of happiness there. Yeah. Um, in in the episode that um, I went back and listened to those episodes too, just to make sure that we weren't kind of going to overlap on them too much when we were talking in the interview. Um, that episode with Chris Colby, he talks about how his mash smelled really great, and he he said if it smells bad, you know, you've done something wrong. And I think that might have something to do with just being a lot, a lot hotter than mine, because ah. um, mine certainly smells terrible. Like if if I was going by that advice only, I would definitely throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they uh, uh, I, I was trying they. They essentially the, the the Oklahoma guys their technique was uh, fairly similar. Uh, they mashed at 148 degrees for 40 minutes, uh, cooled down to 120 degrees uh, for four days. Um, they bo- they only boiled for 30 minutes. So, uh, and I believe that they they won some awards as as well. So, uh, it, well, I was inspired by all of this, and so here's here's what I did. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing a small batch, which is around going to be two gallons. It's going to be enough. It's going to be about the right size to fit into a little uh, plastic Mister Beer fermenter, which are really handy for small batches. Um, <clears throat> so I discovered the other day I was doing a, another small batch recipe, and I was worried about with such a small thermal mass keeping the mash temperature for a full hour in my little kettle. And I was about to wrap it in some blankets outside, even outside in 100 degree or, or 30, 37, 38 <laughs> degrees Celsius uh, weather. Thank you. Uh, the rest of the world appreciates that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's hard to keep the temperature at for an, even an hour in those with those small thermal masses. So I, I said, you know what? I've got this electric smoker that I've been using to smoke a lot of pork butts uh, and chicken and such. And it's, you know, you can dial that in. It's got a temperature range from about 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is around 40, uh, no, 30, uh, 37, 38. Yeah, around there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, C. 
uh, to 275, which is you know way hotter than what we care about in, in, in brewing. Uh, so I said, I'll just – what I did was I just set up the smoker. I set it up to, to the mash temperature and put the, the pot in the smoker. And it held rock solid for an hour, no problem. Cool. So then I said, well, <clears throat> you know, I've been wanting to do a sour mash for a long time, but I didn't, I didn't have an adequate uh, method to, to hold that temperature to my satisfaction for that length of time. I mean, the guys in Oklahoma said that they rigged like a light bulb uh, shine, <laughs> closely shining into their uh, into their plastic uh, cooler, and it like melted part of the cooler. And <laughs> so, uh, so what I did was I set up the smoker, and I dialed it in. I used 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 44 C around there somewhere. Uh, and I put the put the kettle in there, and it's been. I mean, it's the temperature has has fluctuated a little bit as as it gets cool at night and as it overheats during the daytime. But I'm st- the hottest I've seen it is 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 48 C. Uh, and like I said, this morning it was smelling kind of ripe, but this mm-hmm. this afternoon and this evening it is smelling tart. And I think I'm I think I'm headed in, in the right direction. And I hope that tomorrow morning. Uh, or tomorrow by noon, uh, I'll be able to uh, proceed with the, the brewing process. Um, so, if you've got us, if you've got one of those electric smokers at home, here's another use for it. Or if you don't have one, it's another justification to go to. You know, I got mine at Sam's. So, <laughs> <laughs> tell the wife. That's right. <laughs> I, this is a dual purpose thing. It'll feed you uh, and the family, and also, you know, I can brew with it. Whenever you have a list of things, a list of of uh, reasons for something, it's always the last thing in the list. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we can save money on food. I'll cook more often, and I can brew with it. Uh, so anyway, Alton uh, Brown talks about a lot about unitaskers in his kitchen and not not have anything that only does one thing except his fire extinguisher. Um, and when he makes yogurt. Uh, there was an episode where he made yogurt from a culture, and he used a, a heating pad. And I think that that would probably work for this sort of thing too. Kind of anything that will deliver like a mild heat, as long as you're keeping track of it, probably works just fine. That's right. That's right. And there are plenty of uh, programmers out there who, with the with the little controllers and things like that, you know, this is a piece of cake. Um, is there? I mean, what? I mean, just just doing the sour mash to begin with, not knowing what the smells are, not knowing what it's going to look like. It's an intimidating process. <laughs> sure. Have you tasted yours yet? Uh, I, try, I, <laughs> I like put the I put the this morning when it was not tasting so, or not smelling so great. I put the spoon in there and I kind of touched it to my tongue, but I I don't know that there was any you know enough molecules on there to actually trigger my <laughs> taste buds. Uh, <laughs> but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try it uh, this evening though. Um, but yeah, it is intimidating. It's like, like I said, sure my, my lizard brains was saying that's not something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, generations of you know adaption have uh, you know uh, adaptive breeding has 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 led us to the point where we don't want to taste that kind of stuff because it's not food. You know, it doesn't smell like food. But uh, but is there anything that you can do? Anything that you can say to kind of alleviate some of the the fear that we would have of this process? Well, one thing I have noticed is that it it tastes a lot better than it smells, um, even even when it's at that young kind of ripe, horrible, developing stage. Um, it, it smells awful, but if you can get past that and kind of, you don't really want to plug your nose because you still taste you still taste that way. But if you can if you can get past the couple molecules and actually put a, like a, a good taste in your mouth, it it tastes a lot better than it than it smells. Um, <laughs> and kind of is just it's still pretty wordy, even though it smells really bad until it starts to get pretty pretty tart and then it's going to taste strange if you've never really tasted this kind of thing before um but like i said look for something like lemonade and and look for that acidity on your tongue and and you'll 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 have the right kind of character do you do you suggest stirring it up before i taste it or can i just like skim some off the top so you don't want to get the foamy part at the top if there's foam developing in yours i mean i got i had kind of like scum and like a like i said a little bit of an oil slick on mine um 
but the grain kind of falls out just like it does in a mash and, and kind of gets clear on the top. Um, so I tasted mine before I started up because it gets, it gets pretty muddy and starchy. It seems like after, or not necessarily starchy, but like the grain particles are kind of floating around. Um, and I just want, kind of wanted to tell what the liquid tasted like. So I, I just tasted mine, the, the kind of the clear part before I did an infusion and stirred it up. So I just used uh, two row, American two row and malted wheat. Uh, so it sounds like, I mean, if you're use if you if you're just using two row essentially, yeah, it uh, sounds like just about the same thing. And it's amazing. I mean, I'm all for you know getting free stuff, and if I, and if there's free lacto on the grain that I, <laughs> <laughs> if there's free lacto on the grain that I uh, that I already have, and I can learn how to use it, I think you know that's a bonus. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't have to worry about making a starter or anything. Like your mash is your starter. Um, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff or keeping extra culture around or buying it. It's just it's just nice. You already have it. Do you have you used the sour mash in any other beer styles, or do you have any plans to? Um, I do have plans to. Um, so, I, I, as much as I like the really clean character of the Berliner Weiss and the, and the feature, uh, sorry, the uh, the acidic feature in it, um, just how it it is like focused completely on the the lacto, um, the lactic acid. I, I think that that character might really nicely complement uh, saison in kind of like a really light. Um, not nearly as sour as a Berliner Weiss, but kind of like a tart dryness that, that could go with a really good saison. So I do have plans to play with that. Um, I've been wanting to make a Goza for a while, which mm. is very similar to a, a Berliner Weiss, but has some salt and coriander in it, um, which is, I guess, probably another show. Um, but uh, that's kind of the same technique. You, you kind of do a sour mash there too, but not not quite as aggressive as a Berliner Weiss. Um, and I, I think I already mentioned that I had a failed... Flanders Red that has been sitting around for a long time hoping it'll get a little bit more lactic and it just isn't um, and I think if I do another one of those in, in the non-distant future I'll probably give it a head start on the lactic part by just uh, by doing a sour mash to that and, and see how that goes so there's definitely I mean anytime you want kind of a tart lactic character to a beer I think there's place for at least experimenting with the sour mash well I love the sour beers and me too <laughs> uh, I, I've been meaning to to get more into it and uh your your blog post inspired me, so I appreciate. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. That's exactly why I wrote it. Actually, I had people on, on the in the local club asking me how to do it, um, and they had brought it up actually right before the competition we mentioned started. And I knew the beer was in contention, um, and I knew that it had done well in the first round before the best of show judging. So I didn't want to influence the judges at all by talking about it. So I kind of pushed them off for a while on the mailing list. Um, but when I finally wrote about it, it was nice. We have probably three or four. Uh, Sour mash is going in the club right now, cool. um, just just from talking about it. So it's fun, and it's hot here too. So it's it's easier to maintain that high temperature. Hot is a relative thing, Sean. Yeah, I guess <laughs> it's it's we get we get really cold in the winter, so it's nice and hot here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere there's a medium, uh, yeah. a medium between the two. Well, this has been fun. Anything else that we're that we're glaringly missing? Um, I don't think we're glaringly missing it, but uh, one one thing I did with my Berliner Weiss um, that I, um, d- well, the parts that I didn't drink, I guess, um, was I, I made a sorbet from it, uh, just with my ice cream maker. I added some sugar to it, so I did it in about it was about a ratio of um, one cup of beer to half a cup of sugar, uh, just to kind of get the right the right um, sugar level in a sorbet, and just threw it into the ice cream. Well, chilled it down, and then threw it into the ice cream maker. Um, and it made really excellent sorbet, kind of like a lemon lemon kind of sorbet. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it was really. It, it kind of the wheat character came out a little bit more once it was that cold, um, but the acidity was really interesting. Um, and it, it, I mean, it was very much like a like a lemon sorbet, but with a different character than lemon. Um, and uh, it was really nice. I called it a Berliner Ice because <laughs> I'm hilarious. <laughs> very nice. Anyway, Very if you nice. have if you have five gallons of it and you don't quite like it, that's something you might be able to do with it. <laughs> well, excellent. I appreciate it. Like I say, this has been fun, Sean, and I appreciate it. It has. Thanks very much, James. Thanks again to Sean. I'll post a link to his blog post in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. If you try it, let me know how yours turns out. Uh, I tasted mine again this morning been about 48 hours since I first uh, started the sour mashing process, and the sourness is definitely coming through. 
So I have high hopes that the, the nastiness has uh, subsided uh, quite a bit. So uh, I may be brewing this afternoon. I don't know. Uh, look for a future Basic Brewing video episode uh, if it turns out well. I'm going to be shooting video as I brew. I'm, I'm excited. I'm always excited when I try out new stuff, especially if it, uh, if it results in tasty beers. Uh, in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Stephen Rachel, uh, Rachelin Best of Barbecue Insulated Food Gloves. Very cool. I took a look at that and I bought some myself. You can put these gloves on and you can use them to, you know, pull pork without burning yourself. I'm looking forward to that. And Coleman Packaway Kitchen, which is also a cool item. Cool, cool item. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, <laughs> I can't tell who bought what. So no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to and or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate link on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.